Thank you, Bob. If you have your Bibles today, would you turn to Colossians chapter 1? We're in the book of Colossians, New Testament book, Paul's epistle to the church there, Colossians chapter 1. And in just a moment, we're going to begin reading verse 15. You know, as we look at uh, this epistle uh, that Paul wrote to Colossae, we're reminded that Paul wrote 13 epistles in the New Testament, 13 of the books of the Bible. Some of those were written to churches, as we see today. Some were written to individuals, and one of the uh, churches to which Paul wrote was the church at Corinth. And uh, that church had issues, just to be honest. In fact, uh, the church is made up of imperfect people, thus the church is imperfect, and probably no greater evidence of that could be found in Scripture than the church at Corinth, because there were so many issues there. In chapter 3 of Uh, 1 Corinthians there, Paul had to address them not as mature believers, but as very immature. They had been believers for a while, but they had not grown. He said, I must give you milk rather uh, than meat. And then in chapter 5, there was an issue that was just abhorrent in the church there, an issue of immorality where a man had taken his stepmother and the church had not stood strong on Um, standing against that. And then in chapter 6, we move on. There was the issue of uh, division in the church to the point where church members were almost ready to take other church members to court. And, and, And Paul is writing, don't you understand, this would be before unbelievers. This wouldn't be a good thing. And, and, and basically said, don't you know that in the future you will be joint heirs with Christ and rulers over Christ? Can't you settle the issues among yourselves? Then there was the issue of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And in our observance of the Lord's Supper, we have small portions. But in that day, there actually was a feast that accompanied the Lord's Supper. And he had to rebuke the church there because some people were pushing to the front of the line to the neglect of others. They were self-serving in this that was supposed to recognize uh, and honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 14, there was the struggle over spiritual gifts. There were certain individuals that had great pride that thought that their gifts were better. And so there were so many issues in the church at Corinth. And among those issues, the multiple issues, was something that actually dealt with uh, how they related to Paul himself. In fact, He had to rebuke them because uh, the church at Corinth was trying to elevate certain individuals uh, to the highest of position. We hear the term goat. When I was young, if you were a goat, that was a terrible thing. You were the one responsible for something. Today, it means greatest of all time. And so in the church there, they were arguing. Some said, uh, I follow Apollos. Apollos is the greatest. Others were saying, well, you may follow Apollos, but Peter is greater than he is. And still others were saying Paul. And so Paul had to say, stop all of this. He said, I planted Apollos watered, but it is God who gave the increase. And so we look at this danger that can happen in individuals' lives that we want to elevate persons, whether they be superstars, whether they be athletes, whether they be preachers, whether they be any type of public figure, there's the danger to do that. Paul himself in Acts chapter 14, while in the town of Lystra, he and Barnabas were doing great works and the people who were pagan people began to worship them. And Paul and Barnabas, they tore their clothes and they said, people, why are you doing these things? We are people just as you are. In the book of Revelation, John himself experienced the same thing, only with John, he was the one trying to offer the wrong thing praise. And so in in Revelation 19, he sought to uh, bend the knee and offer praise to an angel. And the angel said, look, we're servants just as you are. I'm a servant. I'm a fellow servant with you. Uh, Don't worship. And so throughout scripture, we see the church, we see individuals admonished not to be guilty of false worship. But I want to tell you today, Jesus never rejected worship. 
because Jesus is worthy of all worship. You can look through the scripture and there was never a time when genuine worship was offered to the Lord Jesus from the heart that he rejected it. He always accepted it. And so today we're going to look at the person of Jesus. We're going to see what Paul has to write about Jesus. We're going to look at his person and work. And we see that Paul here is writing with great grandeur uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look with me at Colossians 1, beginning in verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place or preeminence in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard, this gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word today, we thank you for this great picture of Jesus Christ, the truth of your word about who he is, about his position, about his work. And uh, Father, we want to lift up the name of Jesus. If there be any here today who have not trusted Jesus Christ, I pray that this would be the day. And we pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. In our introduction last week, we looked at uh, this uh, entire book of Colossians. We talked about it and Paul's purpose for writing. And one of the three purposes that uh, Paul wrote that we presented last week as to why Paul wrote this book had to do with the threat of false teaching in the church at Colossae there. We know that uh, there was this proto or early form of Gnosticism that existed in the church. And we know uh, that the spiritual was really lifted up uh, to the neglect of the physical and how uh, the people would either deny the, uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ or would try to say uh, other things about that. And, and so as we get into it, and we'll study later in the book of Colossians, there was even the worship of angels, angels being spirit beings, and how uh, Paul had to address the church in Colossians 2.18 about this false asceticism, this self-righteous denial of self that they uh, possessed, and I put quotes around that, but also uh, the worship of the angels. And so it's very important here that we understand who Jesus Christ is. And so this church that was threatened with all these false notions, people saying, well, Jesus came in the flesh, if everything that is of the flesh is evil, how could Jesus be good? And so he had to reject that false notion and he had to express who Jesus truly is. And so today uh, we're going to look at these nine verses and it's a twofold study this morning. First, who Jesus is, his essence, who he is in, in his being. And then secondly, what Jesus has done and is doing. And so first today, I want to uh, answer the question, specifically looking at verse 15 and verse 19 of who Jesus is. Now, God is very direct in his word here. You know, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like riddles. Sometimes I like giving them. I say, well, guess, well, thank, and I'll give a hint, and I'll give a hint. It reminds me of Samson. Remember when he killed the lion with his bare hands, and he went back later, and in uh, the cavity of that body, bees had built a nest. There was, um, there was honey there. It was honeycomb. And, and instead of him going and telling the people, I killed a lion with my bare hands. I went back later and there was a honeycomb in it. He gave a riddle. He said, guess what has happened? Guess what has happened? And so this riddle in English, it rhymes. I don't know how it was in the original language, but it said, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. And you can hear Samson saying, guess what I killed? Guess what was in it? 
What I love about this is the Bible does not leave us guessing about Jesus Christ. It's not some riddle. It's not some nebulous thing out there. But the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is God, that he is both man and God. Now, this is the rare thing. One plus one equals one. Jesus is fully man and fully God in one person. You say, well, how can that be? Well, guess what? The creator is not subject to the laws of creation. Now, I can't be myself and something else at one time, but I'm a finite being. God is not limited by the things that limit us. So anyone who would say Jesus is not God is both a fool and a rejecter of the word of God. Look at what God's word says here in verse 15. Jesus, that is he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Now, that word in the Greek, and you've heard it before is that word icon, which is a representation, the exact image of the invisible God. In other words, to see Jesus is to see God. And Paul adds in verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Who is that? In Jesus. And so these are two verses right here that speak to the deity of Christ. We'll look at another verse later in our study, but I want you to know today, these two would be enough, but the Bible has numerous numerous references to the deity of Christ. In John chapter 8 and verse 58, Jesus said something that drew the attention of the religious leaders of that day. He said, before Abraham, that's Father Abraham, who had lived hundreds of years before Jesus, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, you're not yet 50 years old. How could you say you're older than Abraham? But he wasn't just saying that he predated Abraham. He very specifically used the term that God the Father used of himself. Remember when Moses was sent to go deliver the people out of Egypt, he said, who should I say has sent me? God the Father said, I am. And so Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He said before Abraham was, I am. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are. Are one. In Hebrews 1 3, the writer of Hebrews says, He, that is Jesus, is the exact expression of God's nature. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, as we prepare for Christmas, man, it's coming quickly, isn't it? He was given the name, what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. Do you realize in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 23, Jesus uh, rather, God the Father said of himself, before me at my name, every knee will bow. Every knee will bow before me. What does the scripture say in Philippians 2, verses 10 through 11? At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see, the Bible nowhere accepts false worship, but we see here that the scripture says that Jesus himself will be the object of those who bend the knee. He is fully God. Before we move from that, there's something that's very important that we must understand because a lot of false groups like Jehovah's Witness will try to twist this around, but it's that term firstborn. Look in verse 15, it says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And then in verse 18, he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, uh, the firstborn from the dead. And so here's this question. If he is eternally God, how could he be born? Well, it's very important for us to understand that in scripture, firstborn can mean one of two things. It can mean literally a time of birth, but it also can literally mean an esteemed or exalted position. Uh, think back of the times in the Bible when the firstborn was not the firstborn. In, in, in other words, Jacob and Esau. Esau was literally the firstborn, but who received all the blessing and the benefit of being the firstborn, the birthright and the blessing, it was Jacob. So the one who was secondborn actually was the one who was exalted. Uh, think about Jacob himself when he was preparing to die. He exalted the younger brother Ephraim above the older brother Manasseh. So when he placed his hand under the thigh and, and, and he was trying to be corrected uh, by Joseph and he said, no, no, what I've done, I know what I am doing. And so that had nothing to do with time of birth. But the thing that is so important is in Psalm chapter 89, as God is speaking about David, 
Remember, King David was the youngest of the sons of his father. Remember that? They went through the list and none of them, and Samuel said, no, no, this isn't the one, this isn't the one. Well, we see in Psalm 89, 27, God says, I've appointed David my firstborn, comma, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Now that's something we may have forgotten, I may have forgotten in English that is called an apposition, not opposition. In other words, apposition would be this. This is Bob Walden, a singer at Concord Baptist Church. Rick Caldwell, comma, a pastor of Concord Baptist Church. Karen Caldwell, the wife and better person of Rick Caldwell. So what do we do that? We qualify. We say, and then we qualify. Notice what it says, firstborn, and it doesn't say the firstborn, the first child of Jesse. No, it says firstborn, comma, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. When Jesus is mentioned in the firstborn, it has nothing to do with birth because we see in this entire context, it has to do with exalted position. He alone is Lord. Now follow this. If he is Lord of all and if he is God, which he is, then what does that mean for you and for me? That if we're living our lives with no regard for him, if we're not placing him in the right position of our lives, then we are rejecting God himself. I wonder today, is he Lord over your life? But I want you to see not only who he is, fully God, but what he has done and is doing. We praise him for who he is and for what he is doing and has done. And we see two things in this regard. First, he is the agent and head over all creation. Notice verse 16 and 17. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is the agent of creation and the recipient of the praise of it. Verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things hold together. Notice how it says everything was created by him. All things have been created uh, through him and for him. Jesus is separate from creation. He is the potter, we are the clay. And because Jesus created everything, he couldn't be part of the creation. No more than the potter could be the pottery. And so we see here that while Jesus came in the flesh for a period of 33 years, that Jesus existed before he came. He was born of a virgin, but he existed eternally and exists eternally. And not only that, we see that he is before all things and above all things. And then Paul adds that truth in verse 17. By him, all things hold together. You know, we had some brilliant founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, uh, George Washington, all of these men, they were brilliant. I mean, uh, but they were fallible. They were fallible. Just as a preacher would be, just as we saw these people that were being elevated, as great as they were in their brilliant minds, they were fallible in many ways. And one way uh, that many of our founding fathers were fallible was this. They were deists. And Deus basically said, yeah, God created the world, but God's like a great clock maker. He created the world, wound it up, and left it to run on its own. So it's almost like a disinterested parent, a disinterested clock member, uh, uh, maker. I, I've made it, just let it run on its own. And that can lead almost to this humanist type of, of mindset. But guess what? That's not what the scripture teaches because it says that Jesus, verse 17, holds all things together. Not only did he create us, but he did not create us and leave us alone. He created us and he holds us together. He is the creator and the sustainer. The sun rose today. Praise him. You were awakened today. A week or so ago, I, mean, I was struggling with sleeping, man, at night. I don't know what it was. About maybe three, four hours a night. Man, the last two nights I've slept well. You know what? I wake up, I say, Lord Jesus, thank you for letting me be able to sleep. He's the one who sustains us. I wonder today, is he in the right place in your life? He's Lord of all creation. Have you trusted him? Are you walking with him? Is, are you consumed with him? But not only is he the agent 
of that. He is the agent and head over recreation. He's the God of all creation and of recreation. Notice what it says in verses 20 through 23 and also verse 18. First verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. The pastor is not the head of the church. He's not. If he thinks he is, he's wrong. The deacons are not the head of the church. The oldest members are not the head of the church. There's one head of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. My favorite preacher, you've heard me say before, Dr. Adrian Rogers said, anything, everything must have one head. Anything that has no head is dead, and two heads is a freak. And that's true. And so there's one head of the church, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And even as the head of our bodies is the central source of our physical body, he is the central source of the church. And as firstborn from the dead, he is above all who experience spiritual birth through him. Are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? It is through him. It is through him and, and he alone. It is through his blood that was shed on the cross for you. That's what the end of verse 20 said, that he made peace through his blood that was shed on the cross. Now let's not make the mistake here. He's the head of the body, the church. That's not speaking of the brick and mortar here, not the physical structure. Yes, he's Lord of that, but it's speaking more clearly of the organism, of the living entity, of the people that make up the church. And so it's speaking of all those who have believed. So while he's the agent of creation, which is over all people who've ever walked the face of the earth and all of nature, he is also uh, the agent of recreation, those in the church. Second um, Corinthians 5, 17. Um, and I think it might've been Janet I, I, on Facebook, maybe it posted a lot of times she'll place pictures and scripture and it was here in the last day or two second uh, corinthians 5 17 therefore if anyone is in christ that person is a new creation the old has passed away and see all things have become new so with all respect to mr franklin and thomas jefferson who were great in their own sight god's no deist Jesus is working today, and he's working to reconcile everything to himself. But before we close this morning, how does this apply to us? He's the God over all the universe. He's the God over the church. He's the Lord of creation and recreation. But what does that mean to me? Well, I want to share just a brief parable, a brief teaching of Jesus, and then we'll look at where verses 20 through 23 say. The first is a parable, the parable of the lost sheep. You may have read about it. There were a hundred sheep. One of them went astray and, and the shepherd went after the one leaving the 99. Why is that? That one mattered. Among all of the hundred, that one mattered. And then a brief illustration from Jesus' life in John chapter 13, before Jesus would die on the cross, he did something very, what we would consider mundane, especially in that day. In that day, many people walked on dusty paths. Their feet were dirty. They would come into buildings. They would need to have their feet washed. And many times the servant, not the Lord of the house, the servant would do it. But Jesus got down on his knees and washed the disciples' feet. P Peter felt like that wasn't his role. He said, Jesus, don't do it. Jesus said, if you don't allow me to do it, you have no part in me. Then Jesus said, not just, I mean, Peter said, not just my feet, but all of it. And Jesus said, you don't need that. But let me wash your feet. In other words, the God of all creation cares about one. The God of all creation bent the knee and served those that he created. That is the Jesus that we worship. Now think of the God of all the universe. I was so upset the other night or other morning when I woke up and saw all the pictures of the northern lights and I missed it. I was just... I, mean, I try to keep up with the news. I went out, somebody said, I think it was Thursday night, they said it might be Friday night. I was out there looking and I saw nothing. If you saw that, raise your hand. If you personally saw the Northern Lights, I'm jealous of y'all. 
was awesome, wasn't it? I mean, think about it. No artist could do that. Jesus created that. Jesus sustains it. Think of the church. Now, it's probably overemphasized the number, maybe overcalculated, 2.8 billion. We don't know who's truly saved or not, but 2.8 billion profess that. 2.8 billion people, and he died for you. He died for you with, with you on his mind. You know, imagine for a moment that we were to have a, a very famous person come in here and they would be packed to the hilt and everybody admired this person and you were sitting out there and that person would say, hey, Rick, you, you come up here and introduce you to all this crowd. Now, don't be, don't be lying. You'd think you were the real deal, wouldn't you? Out of all these people, everybody wants the attention and he points me out. That's what Jesus did for you. The God of all creation, the Lord over the church, care for you. What has Jesus done for you? Look at verse 21. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds is expressed in your evil actions. In other words, before you came to know Jesus, you weren't living for him. You were living for yourself. You were hostile in your mind. You were, you were estranged from him. You were separated from him. I've been reading an old book. It was written by Tim LaHaye back in 1980, The Battle for the Mind. And it talks about the battle of humanism. Now, humanism has moved toward postmodernism, post-Christian mindset, which is all ungodly. But in it, written 44 years ago, he notes in the book that our culture then and most certainly now has been encased in a humanistic philosophy that tries to remove God and says that man is good. That's false. We're not good. We're sinners. We have wrong motives. We have wrong desires. Left to ourselves, we're not righteous, we're unrighteous. And it says it begins in our minds inwardly and express through our actions. And so we see that every person, you and I included, have at some point been estranged from God. But I want you to see that Jesus acted. Verse 22, a strong adversity, but now, but now, he has reconciled you by his physical body. When the people were enslaved in Egypt, God personally delivered them. You say, well, Moses was the instrument. Yeah, Moses was used of God. Moses didn't part that sea. God parted the sea. He acted to bring them physical salvation. And through Jesus, God has acted to bring us salvation. He's the initiator. And I want you to notice he has reconciled you, which means brought you into right standing, back into right standing. I want you to see the means by his physical body. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't just to set an example of sacrifice. He died on the cross to pay the price of your sin, to be the substitute for you. And, and the reason he did it, the purpose is to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. I was reading a prayer this week by a Puritan named David Clarkson. And in this prayer, it speaks of God's greatness and goodness. It was a simple part of his prayer. He said, you, Lord, whose splendor dazzled the seraphim, were in love for us, willing to be despised and rejected. That's the gospel. Jesus gave himself for you. But I want you to see finally the centrality of the gospel. Verse 23, after stating what Jesus has done, he said, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith. Now we need to be very careful there because if can mean a number of things. It can plant doubt. But there are also times when if can be a statement of faith. I'd say if you're so strong, Come up here and knock me out. I mean, since you think you're so strong, sometimes if can carry the idea of sense. And so it's not placing doubt. It's not saying that, oh, I better keep my salvation or I'll lose it if I have any seed of doubt. I'm not in, in all commending doubt. But even John the Baptist himself once said and sent message to Jesus, tell us, is it, are you really the one or not? John the Baptist was great. It's not saying that you and I are going to be perfect, but what it's saying is this hold to the gospel. 
The gospel is the message of salvation from the point of, 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 of initial belief to the point when God takes you home. There's never a time when the gospel is irrelevant to you. It is central. He says, remain grounded and steadfast in the faith. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation of which I've become a servant. There's salvation in no other name than Jesus. I wonder today, have you come to know the one who is both great Lord over creation and recreation, yet also loves you enough that in your wandering, he sought you out? Have you trusted him, this one who is worthy of the praise of both angels and all of mankind cares for you? He died for you. Have you trusted him? Let's pray. Father, if there be any here today who have yet to trust you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Lord, this would be the day. And Father, there may be some here today who would say, I'm not sure if, if I'm right with God. I need Jesus Christ in my life. Lord, I pray you would stir their hearts just silently where they are now to pray a prayer similar to this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, I thank you for caring about me. That Lord, when I live my life with no thought for you, Lord, you are sustaining and watching over not just creation, but me. I thank you, Lord, for awakening me today. And Lord, I pray you would forgive me of my sin. I pray, Lord, believing that Jesus Christ died to pay the price of my sin to make me right with you. And that, Lord, through faith in Jesus and faith in Jesus alone, I can be in right standing with you. And so, Lord, uh, as this prayer was prayed, maybe uh, by people in this congregation today, I pray you would seal that decision. And, Lord, you would encourage those who have trusted in you. And I pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. He never refused worship. And so we worship the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe recently you've trusted Christ. It's very important not just to believe in your heart, but to be willing to make that public. One way we give you an opportunity is during this song that we're just singing.